Okay, today we're going to talk about uh, Victorian England, and this lecture will be in three parts. The first part will be a general overview of Victorian England. The second part will be a discussion of Oscar Wilde and aestheticism. Even though we're not reading The Importance of Being Earnest, I still think touching on Wilde's ism uh, is contribution to our march of isms this semester is important. And then the third part will be about George Bernard Shaw and socialism. <clears throat> so we are dealing with uh, Victorian England as defined primarily by the reign of Queen Victoria, 1837 to 1901. There's a nice before and after picture of uh, Queen Victoria. And she really was the person who, um, well, her reign really was, was the time that, that Britain rose from being a dominant power to the absolute dominant world power. Um, by the end of the 1900s, it's Britain and maybe Germany and the Americans are coming along, but really um, so much of what we think of as British culture was created and defined during the Victorian era. So a couple of overview elements here that we need to talk about. This whole business of the Industrial Revolution is a key aspect of what informs what's going on in Victorian England. So the, the continuous advance of science and technology, the explosion of inventions, uh, the explosion of factory work, that whole notion of urbanization where people move from the country to the city and take up uh, factory jobs for low wages in problematic living conditions and the sort of social misery is a big part of this. Um, Shaw was the, was one of the many people who fought against those uh, sort of social problems as a result. But this is Victorian England sees the invention of the first photograph, rubber tires, sewing machine, the first indoor toilet, the first subway, the first typewriter. There are numerous uh, uh, just sort of things we consider standard everyday conveniences that were invented in, in the Victorian era. In addition to that, this is also a significant era of intellectual engagement. So not only in the science and technology aspect are we making stuff, uh, but we are also, uh, in, in the Victorian era, using your mind is tremendously important. We have a lot of political activists, thinkers, uh, philosophers, all kinds of people who are uh, intellectually engaged. There's all kinds of social activism uh, and reform, uh, both in terms of you know, we get the beginning of the uh, women's rights movement to some degree. We get the beginning of the labor movement. Uh, Shaw, again, uh, has some things to say about that. Um, we get a further and almost total emphasis on the university education. <clears throat> this is still mostly the upper, the middle and upper middle classes who are going to college, but the importance of a university education as part of being a British citizen is really nailed down during the Victorian era. And um, this is also the era of colonialism. The British Empire is at its height during the Victorian era, um, and we are talking about Britain having controlling interests in, among other places, Ireland, Central Africa, um, India, China. Like Britain is all over the globe at this point, um, obviously. And so one of the key motivations for right, having all that territory, the British claimed, was that we need to go out and find these primitive cultures and we need to civilize them. Uh, and that colonial impulse to take, quote unquote, primitive cultures, almost always dark skinned people, right? If we're talking about Africa, India, China, um, or uh, the Americas, we're talking about cultures, people who look different from us, non-Europeans, and we need to civilize them. In this really problematic sense, right? Um, <clears throat> because, okay, we claim to be bringing these people Christianity and cricket and tea and government and all this other stuff. But actually, in Victorian England, what, we're, what, what they're usually mainly doing is colonizing them to steal their resources. So... There are all sorts of cultural and historical problems that result with this uh, emphasis of colonialism. It creates a significant amount of economic wealth for Victorian England, which is one of the reasons why this era was so prosperous and why Britain was so powerful. This is also an era, if you know anything about Victorian England and about general British uh, stodginess, the notions of societal rigidity, which has been a part of England for a long time, really get nailed down and quantified in the Victorian era. Um, social codes, social strata. So the idea that if you're born into one class, you will always be of that class. Um, and Or social codes, as in the way you speak to other people is extremely formalized, right? Imagine only ever addressing your parents as father or mother or sir or ma'am. Um, those levels of, of super uh, rigid and codified uh, social codes is, is a big deal for what it means to be Victorian uh, in this era. And there are all kinds of means of basically individual repression uh, that define what it is to be Victorian. 
So we'll talk about a couple of the cultural contexts. Um, let's talk about women and how women were treated in this era. There are all kinds of really interesting ways in which uh, women in England were viewed, treated, and acted, uh, behaved. And they frequently line up with kind of what we talked about in the 19th century uh, American context. So in the Victorian era, we get women who are increasingly socially active. Um, they are forming clubs outside the house. Uh, they are forming things like uh, um, the very beginnings of the Crusades for Women's Rights. Um, and the most stereotypical example of this that you could probably think of, and this is not quite Victorian, but the suffrage campaign in Mary Poppins. Uh, that's the later end, and it's a little bit anachronistic because it happens again later. But the idea that women are getting outside of the house, they're getting together um, for clubs, they're helping found things like the Salvation Army, they're helping uh, approach uh, sort of social problems from a charitable standpoint, um, and basically becoming a little bit more independent than they have before. That doesn't mean this is a super progressive era, of course, because by and large, women in this era still don't have, uh, they're, they're, they're still intended to be um, sort of seen and not heard. They're not true participants in the British society. They are, one of the reasons for that is we have this very old stereotype of how women must be viewed um, as, <laughs> from, a, from a sexual standpoint, as a little bit dangerous and a little bit bipolar. And so the Victorian England stereotype of women is that they are either frigid or sexually insatiable. So we get this sort of like the frigid bitch or the um, um, slut stereotypes, right? Obviously, these are not based on any fact, but this is how women were seen. The overall result of those stereotypes is that women needed to be protected from men, but they also needed somewhat to be protected from themselves. And there are some ways in which the Victorians went about doing that, which I'll talk about in a second. One of the results, though, is that as a Victorian British woman, if you want to be seen as morally upstanding, and remember, just like in the Americas, middle class is defined in this era as morally upstanding, then you must uh, have that external appearance of complete innocence. Any exterior, uh, any external display of sexuality is completely inappropriate and completely improper, right? Um, this is the era where showing a little ankle was slutty. Uh, if you think about Victorian uh, women's dress, it covers and hides any sort of hint of the female shape and really tries to uh, desexualize women in a lot of different ways. Another way in which women are sort of controlled and managed is through this super rigid code of social etiquette that I mentioned earlier. Appearance is the most important thing. Behavior, what you actually do, is not quite so important, but how you appear to behave is important. And so um, there are all sorts of manuals for how to behave, social etiquette manuals. So, right, if you are um, an up-and-coming lady in, say, age 13, 14, 15, 16, your mother's going to teach you how to behave at a party, teach you how to behave when you're out. But you can also go by numerous books that teach you how a lady acts. Um, a couple examples from such books. These are direct quotes. If a gentleman, without proper introduction, should ask a lady with whom he is not acquainted to dance or promenade, the lady should positively refuse. To sum that up, if a guy you don't know asks you to dance, you must refuse. So all invitations or all meetings between the sexes must be prearranged. People must know each other. There's almost always a chaperone. Um, and, and basically, strangers don't talk to each other because, as we note in the previous bullet point here, women are kind of, you know, may fall prey to their insatiable sexual urges. Uh, again, you can see why society in this era was, eh, we move forward a little bit for women, but also not so much. Here's another quote. A lady should not attend a public ball without an escort, nor should she promenade the ballroom alone. In fact, no lady should be left unattended. Again, this notion of chaperoning and this really rigid code of how women are to be uh, seen and viewed and interacted with by men. It's always controlled, it's always chaperoned, and it's always in the most sort of apparently upstanding moral circumstances. So, we all read The Importance of Being Earnest in Aesthetics too. Um, one of the things I definitely want to bring back in, and you don't have to read the play again, but generally remember it, and we'll talk about this in class, in what ways generally does Ernest challenge that vic this Victorian view of women? Uh, and how does Wilde get away with it? Because we'll talk about Wilde here in a minute, but he criticized his the British, uh, the Victorian society quite a lot, and really did a good job of getting away with it. So, Consider those two questions and come in uh, to class ready to talk about those things. And when we get down to talking about Shaw and Major Barbara later, 
tell me how he handles gender roles, because all things considered, both Shaw and Wilde are relatively progressive when it comes to women, relatively. And uh, there are all kinds of different ways to look at what they actually say, but think about Major Barber, the character in the play, as being a proactive feminist woman. Is she or isn't she? And what kind of um, support can you bring to that? And what kind of criticisms can you, can you bring to the idea of Major Barber as a feminist play? Okay, this is just sort of a sidebar, but I want to talk briefly about race. Um, it's just sort of an interesting thing. It doesn't directly tie into any play we're going to read, but the Victorians had some very strong views about race. They believed that there was a parallel between the working classes and the inferior, read, dark-skinned races. Again, the notion here that... Um, People are born into a certain strata of society and they stay there because their genes require that they stay there is key to Victorian England. So um, the, the Victorian English white person's view was working class people are inherently inferior. Also, black people and Asians and Indians and Native Americans are inherently inferior. Uh, and that's that's genetic, right? And there are all kinds of problematic elements of science, quote unquote science, uh, that are brought in. And I'll show you one of these here in a minute and culture to support that idea. So we've got some um, extremely sort of problematic racial views in this era. It's, it's interesting, but um, what we get really is um, a, a notion that the working class and the inferior races are childlike, are unreasonable, are irrational, and are genetically unable to comprehend or respect high-minded concepts like religion or private property. And it's this very snooty, snooty, uh, uh, sort of keep the people in their place mentality. <clears throat> and it is supported by things like the science, quote-unquote science, of phrenology. And if any of you guys have heard of phrenology before, it it is a science that claims to know, you look at the upper right-hand corner image, the different parts of the brain, <laughs> right, which is obviously a complete lie. We don't even really know for sure some of the different parts of the brain even today. So they're just making this stuff up, right? Um, it claims to know where the different parts of the brain, um, where parts of the personality exist in the brain. Then it claims to create a system, you see here on the left, that can measure your, the shape of your skull and can determine your inherent intelligence and um, abilities based purely on the shape of your skull. Not surprisingly, the as you see down here at the bottom, white skulls, male, female, are tend to give off more positive results in the phrenological sense. and Dark-skinned skulls, Indian and Negro, tend to give off more problematic, um, as in phrenology supported the idea that black people and Indians and dark-skinned people weren't as intelligent. It's, of course, all complete bullshit, but it is this sort of example of science and culture, or science, on which some of these very racist behaviors are developed. Uh, so, just something to keep in mind that uh, just because we have science in, the, in this era doesn't mean we have correct science. Uh, and as you recall, one of the things I do is uh, require you only in any of my classes to use research resources that were written after 19, after World War II. This is one of the reasons, because a lot of this stuff passed as accurate scientific research, and it just wasn't. And so once you get to you know, around World War II, now we're in a much more reliable place. So that, generally speaking, is an overview of the cultural context of the Victorian era and kind of what's going on in, the, in that era. Stay tuned for part two, in which we will discuss Oscar Wilde and aestheticism.